Hello and welcome to the Manchester is Red podcast. My name is Stephen Railston. We're recording this episode on a Friday afternoon after United drew 3-3 with Porto in the Europa League. Samuel Lucas was at that game. He's currently in the, the airport in Barcelona, um, a little layover as he heads back to Manchester. So we're going to rattle through this podcast. It's going to be quicker than usual, around 20 minutes, because Samuel is pushed for time. So let's just get straight into it, Samuel. It almost feels like a defeat that game, because United had a two-goal lead within 20 minutes. They look so comfortable. We're thinking this is an excellent performance, a great response after the hammering against Tottenham. And they capitulate, they fall apart. Porto claw themselves back into the game, have a 3-2 lead. Obviously, Harry Maguire scores that last-minute goal. We'll get on to that. But again, questions for Eric Ten Hag to answer. Like I say, it did feel like a defeat. It was a strange one in that they, they got a 91st minute equaliser and rightly their supporters celebrated it, the players celebrated it. It was difficult to make out how jubilant the United fans were because they were on the far side and in the second tier quite high up and they were allowed for it in the first half. But that they weren't particularly loud in the second half given what was going on and of course when you get a draw like that you're going to go over to the, the supporters there's going to be mutual appreciation for one another and there were positives last night but that game I mean I, I, I felt even before it had United won handsomely it wouldn't really have reduced that much pressure on Ten Hag maybe in a, a few weeks to come it could have had a big bearing on their form or what have you but the alarming thing is that it was a, practically a carbon copy of their European games last season, that they had a, a two-goal lead, they threw it away, they didn't win, it looked like they were going to lose. Um, at, at least it wasn't like Copenhagen, it was, it was more of a Galatasaray vintage, but of course they threw it away again at Galatasaray last season as well. And this is the issue with Ten Hag and this team and this squad, this and this season, it feels like an extension of last season. We all know why that is, because Ineos lost their nerve in the summer. And really, we're, we're just waiting for that call to be made. And unfortunately, it is as long as this goes on, the more we're just going to have to talk about it. And we'd rather not talk about it. We'd rather talk about more original things. But you, you can only blame the people at Ineos for that, because United are repeating the same mistakes. And it's it, it's very familiar watching them, and, and the familiarity you get with watching them is of, of a negative sort uh, more often than not. Rob Dawson tweeted, I think a few of us saw, uh, retweeted his tweet uh, during the game, and he said, just in Europe since the start of last season, United have conceded two goals in four minutes at Bayern Munich, two in ten minutes against Galatasaray at home two and four minutes against Copenhagen away and two and nine minutes against Galatasaray away and now two and seven minutes obviously against Porto. It's a structural problem that Samuel, when you watch that game, when United go 2 nil up, the players are so deep, they're not continuing to take the game to Porto and to play in their half as a top team would. Why are they not going for the third goal and trying to play in the opponent's half? They're just invited on pressure and in the end they got what was bound to happen. With those crosses coming in the box, it was just a mess. Even before United scored, I noticed the positioning of the defenders was a bit all right, of De Ligt and, and Martinez, because Porto in the first few minutes were actually, you know, they, they got into United's territory a couple of times and they looked they look pretty dangerous. And these hoiks that were going in, and we, we had a very vertiginous view right at the top. And so it's, it's where the analysts would sit. And when they've got that tactical vantage point, they should be able to get that message down to the dugout that you might want to adjust something here or something there and there was a point during the stoppage that De Ligt came over to Ten Hag and had a word with him about something or other but clearly whatever the message was it, it didn't filter through um, because you look at the, the first two goals their crosses well all three goals came from down the left hand side that's a different story altogether Ten Hag persists with Diogo Dallo down the left I don't think he should I think he should be playing Dallo at right back and if you can, if you continue and continue to play that way, you're going to make mistakes. Um, but Dillit had a really bad night. The fact that they had such a good start and they were tuning up after 20 minutes was definitely, was definitely a form of progress. It was, it was a terrific start. They, they got a literal helping hand or two from Diogo Costa there. And we have seen before them even go 3 0 up in, in, in games and still not be all 3 1 up in games. And it's still far from 
far from secure. And clearly it's a mentality issue and clearly it, it comes down to the manager. Yeah, it's not good enough. We've seen it so many times before. And as you as you say, it's Groundhog Day when you're analyzing like it. It's happening again. The negativity spilled into this season. We were of the opinion that a change should have happened in summer. It obviously didn't. Um, and they're now paying the price for winning the FA Cup, it seems. That defensive line, Samuel, as you've said, it, it was a mess for the 90 minutes. The Lit and Martinez, they both had really, really poor evenings. They were eventually substituted for Johnny Evans and Harry Maguire. I think eyebrows might have been raised uh, at that change. Obviously, Maguire pops up at the end and, and scores the goal. Shows tremendous character again, that player. Um, should we have a quick word on the Lit and Martinez, though? Because that was the Lit's worst game since signing for the club, wasn't it? And I've made the point that I think Martinez has actually been off the pace this season. I think he's been flying at the challenges, being rash. Uh, they both just had a really, really disappointing evening. Well, I, th I think had Maguire been deemed fit enough to start, he might have started just for rotation purposes. And he certainly got to start on Sunday. I, I would far, if, if I'm a United fan, uh, well, a knowledgeable United fan, that there are quite a few out there who aren't knowledgeable, um, I'd, I'd be wanting Maguire up against Ollie Watkins and John Jerome. Um, you know, and Maguire has obviously got the confidence booster of, of getting a, a late equaliser as well. But De he's, I've discussed it before in terms of the transfer strategy and the choice of players, and the, the, there are so many of them that I, I just wouldn't have signed just because of their past association with Ten Hag, um, working with Ten Hag. De Ligt is a player who, it's, it's been difficult for him in the past five years, the amount of managers he's had, but he has been a player in decline. There have been some decent times with him this season, but there have also been some signs that he's maybe in a quick for the Premier League. There's not a lot of pace in that back line either. Um, the is not the quickest, but he, is, you know, he's, he has been around the block in the Premier League and he had a good season last season. But it's you know, saying something about this manager that Maguire was a player who was looking to shift last year. Maguire has been one of the United's most consistent performers over the past 12 months or so. Um, again, it's just, it's just not a good look, really. And still, it five years ago, he didn't. Great for United, I think everybody would have agreed, but he's, he's assigning based on what he did five years ago rather than what he's done the past five years. And it's, it's a, bit, a bit curious that there are some fans out there that, that can't see it or perhaps they don't want to see it. But he's, he's very much assigning in, in the manager's image at the manager's behest. And, and so far, it's, it's early days, but it's it's not working and he's not he's not a youngster he's a, he's a 25 year old he's played at three very big clubs already and if you can't if you struggle to hack it at Juventus you struggle to hack it at Bayern Munich you, you've got to be some player to hack it at, at Manchester United particularly this Manchester United Maguire is constantly derided and underappreciated. He has been over the last few years. He was, he was obviously responsible for some of that. Um, he was awful for two years, but he showed a lot of resilience and character to claw himself back from that. I was delighted for him to get that goal. Um, he's really a player that you want to be in the trenches with because he just doesn't give in and he's got that resilience. He's such a leader in that dressing room. We'll talk about Marcus Rashford as well then, Samuel. He was substituted at half-time. Um, his work to score the goal, I think his feet were fantastic on that left side and he drove into the box. It was obviously an element of fortune with the goalkeeper's mistake. He should have done better and should have saved that. Um, but Rashford was brought off at half-time, which was very surprising because he was United's biggest attack and threat. Ten Hag's then confirmed after the game that it was due to a rotation. And I'll be completely honest with you, Samuel, my jaw dropped when I heard that. I, w I was shocked. I was very, very surprised. And for me, it sounded like a decision from a manager that almost wants to be sacked. It, he is making decisions that managers make when they've entered the end game. And when they make decisions like that, it's, it's just not normal decisions. It's not decisions that they usually make. I think if Jamie Redknapp came out and said something must have gone on, I think everybody would agree with him on this occasion. A couple of weeks ago, I thought that was unfounded and there was a lack of context there. But in relation to the change last night, Rashford was the guy who was responsible for putting United to up pretty much. He, was, he obviously got the goal and he put Hoyland in. And when, when the players were coming off, well, it looked like Ahmad was, was limping or, or, or walking a little bit gingerly. And when Garnacho came out to warm up, we thought, all right, it must be that Ahmad's got a knock. And then you see it's not 
Rich Rashford has come off and you think, well, he's got to be injured. And sometimes, and I know it's a bit of a dark thing to say as a journalist because you want managers to be candid and open with their answers and ten hard hits, but it was probably advisable for him to have lied with to, to maybe just say, you know, that he, he got a bit of a nod, he's got a big game on Sunday, don't want to risk it, and it was, you just you tell Marcus Rashford to not not breathe a word of this to anyone, but to be that upfront about taking a player off who will put you two in a lap in a game that's deadlocked at two two and so that it's rotation, it's just downright bizarre. And a lot of people will, will assume something happens. And yeah, we, I had to go uh, in, in the press conference afterwards just to try to get a little bit more uh, from from Ten Hag after what he told TNT. <laughs> And, and he acknowledged that the defending down the left was, was a problem. And you look at Rashford's role in the lights. Jao Mario runs off in for the first goal. He's Jao Mario's one who crossed it in. And his tracking back there is, is half hearted, to say the least. But his, his tracking back has always been half hearted. That's, um, it's, it's, it's been that way for, for several years. And sometimes you have to just accept that with, with certain players that they're, they're unlikely to change. But if, if the good outweighs the bad, then, then it's fair enough. But it, it was just counterproductive. And in fairness, though, to Ten Hag, what I would say um, in his defence there was that I thought Garnacho show was very good in the second half. And Ten Hag said afterwards, he's been our, he's been our best player. So he said, because I said, Rashford was your best player in the first half. I said, yes, but Garnacho was my best player on Sunday. And I suspect that if Garnacho was being fit enough to start that game, it might have been him on the left and Namad on the right. As it happens, it wasn't, and Rashford had. It's a very good half, but it's it is a contradiction because in those first three or four games of the season, when I think there were two or three excuses or opportunities to say Rashford out of the team, Ten Hag did, and he kept him playing, and he was playing him for 90 minutes before last night. Rashford hadn't completed 90 minutes in his past five appearances for United, and then he plays as well as he did for 45 minutes, and he comes off. It, like whatever the context Ten Hag has tried to provide, it is absolutely logical. And you, you have to suspect that, that there is something else that has, has possibly gone on there, just because of how bizarre it was that Rashford came off. But in fairness to Garnacho, he was one of the few in the second half who came out of it, came out of it with any credit. Um, you know, he does not go into hiding, he kept probing, you know, and drew a good save from, from Costa. And I think it's safe to assume that he'll, he'll be starting against Villa on, on Sunday. But the, the, the Rashford issue is, is obviously not going to go away. Certainly, as long as Ten Hag is at United, I think it's safe to say that Rashford will be at United longer than Mary Yeah, Ganacho contributed a lot when he came off from the bench, so, so fair enough, but the decision to take off Rashford was absolutely bizarre and like you, I did have that thought, has something gone on and naturally fans will have that thought. Jimmy Redknapp was wrong, wasn't he, a few weeks ago when he was speculating, but I mean, you can't blame fans for doing the same this week. Um, Bruno Fernandes was sent off with 10 minutes to go, a high boot, he could have no complaints about that, could he, this time? Um, I guess focusing on in, in Ten Hag, Samuel, I know you've got to go soon, but I feel like this situation was depressingly predictable, wasn't it? We we analysed and went over it at length last season, in the spring and in the summer. We all saw it coming. I feel like anyone with a level head saw the evidence. It was compelling, but clearly Ineos didn't agree with that evidence and kind of reaping what they've, they've sowed. And that's why United don't look much different from last season, despite spending or committing to invest more than £200 million in five more signings. This this team, this squad, it's, it's been his for well over a year. The first season, yeah. fair enough, it, we had to adjust some some things there, make some tweaks, and we inherited a lot. But he actually did very well with, with that inheritance. And, of course, he put his own stamp on the team. He, he rebranded the defence with that Latino flavour. There was uh, some, ver some very, very good, two, two very good midfielders who came in and have been around the block. And then he gets more backing and more backing. And he's been, he's been backing with being in Preston since the Manchester United manager. And they get some worse. I, I was... I wasn't staggered by the decision in the summer because I wrote a story two days after the cup final that they were seriously considering keeping him and that was 
that was a little bit watered down from what I was told. What I was told was that it was, it was a lot, lot likely than that. You, know, you always want to, to cover yourself um, over something, over a decision that was clear. It was become a 50 50 call. But it just didn't make any sense. And I know in your sort of private context, and they felt the structure was an issue, which it was, and they wanted to support with the structure. But there are certain things that you see watching United that come down to the manager, and it's, it's time of just repeating oneself uh, that it's too practical and underestimated the role of the manager, the state of Rails for its real house assignment, things like that. Ineos have got experience of running football clubs, but none at any one level of, of United, of course, and they should have been braced for the sports need, but in the end, they, they made a populist decision of keeping the manager just because a fanzine poll or fans online were saying you've got to keep it because we just beat Manchester City in a game that was not a reliable reflection of their performance in the last season or their, their quality because they punched them up their way in City and United had a great game. Great win, great FA Cup victory, but it completely masked the issues in that squad. And now they've got three wins in ten this season, one win in the last ten European games, two consecutive three nil fashions at home in the league by Liverpool and Tottenham. And the game at the weekend, even if United won that, it shouldn't, it shouldn't change what, what needs to happen. It's, it's up to them to actually decide on when they're, when they're going to make that decision. Because as I said, it's well and truly mired in the end game now. Knives could be out at the weekend at Aston Villa. Um, it's going to be a really tough game, that one. They've just beat Bayern Munich in the Champions League. I think it's a shame that Ten Hag's tenure is now threatening to end on a sour note, considering how good his first season was, considering a lot of the good work he's done, reconnecting the fans, the players, restoring discipline. But the decision should have been made in the summer. It should have been taken out of his hands, and it wasn't. And now it's ending it in this manner, which I do think is a shame because it, he could have ended on the positive note of lifting the FA Cup. They obviously finished eighth in the Premier League, but he would have had a lot of goodwill from supporters if he'd left in May after that success. Aston Villa then, Samuel, very briefly, you've just touched upon it. It kind of feels ominous considering the October international break is just around the corner. International breaks are synonymous with managerial changes, of course. And it does feel like it would be a surprise if Ten Hag was still in charge of United beyond that international break. I don't think it would be, uh, really, because they have gone on record as giving their, their full backing. I think they're going to want to, to be a little bit stubborn, partly, um, just to try and innovate in terms of justify their decision. But I think they. My personal view is that they should just take ownership of the cock up they made and keep it and hold their hands up, say that I'm not relying on the national of one in the building, um, that, that they didn't have any official say in the decision making process. We wanted to make it work, we wanted to you know, back him and support him, but we've drawn conclusions already that we, we made an error there and we've, we've, got to, we've got to move on as a club and, and get someone else in because it's in the best interest of Manchester United. That's what it comes down to. Is it good for Manchester United to have Eric Ten Hag as manager? No, it isn't. It was, it was a year ago. It was two years ago, definitely. Um, but this calendar year, it's, it's, a, it's a strange one because of course they have, they've got the FA Cup on display in the mega store or the, you know, the museum. Fans can go to the mega store and have a picture with it. And that, that was a truly wonderful day for for, for the club. We, we all saw we, we all saw how euphoric the supporters were, the staff were, and the players to to one won the FA Cup. But how how often do we see a, a team win a cup competition? It completely masks it, it just masks the problems. It's just a bit of it was, it was almost a form of escapism. It was some respite that day, and now reality is it's biting again. And it's, yes, we can look at some of the meaningful positive this season for the first half at Palace um, how clinical they were at Southampton but that's the United won a medal for that but for beating Southampton the kind of dominant half against Crystal Palace and South West Park Crystal Palace side have still got one in the league uh, this season as well and 
was, they, they've really got to earn their kudos and they did in the first season under Ten Hag and like I said but since then there have been very very few occasions where you've come away from watching those and thought they you know, really deserved their applaud it's the cup final of course was an example of that but this season if everyone would have known that if you'd say someone was on the United win through their first 10 games in the season you would predict the, the move being the one Lucky is at the moment. We'll leave it there then. I'm aware the audio might not be the best and that you're, you are about to board uh, an aeroplane. So thanks to you, Samuel. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks a lot. Thanks to the listeners as usual, and we'll speak to you soon. Bye bye.